What's up to all my freelancers and creatives? This is Nathan and I finally made it. I am here in Las Vegas, Nevada, my first time in Las Vegas, and it started raining. But besides that point, it looks like it's about to stop so I'll be able to see a little bit of the city. As I mentioned earlier, this is my first time in Las Vegas and I'm here for MicroConf. MicroConf is a conference where software as a service founders, builders, and those who are involved in building their own products can come together and share real ideas on how to grow their businesses. But not only that, it's separated into two parts. They got one side, which is about growth. So you have an established business, product, or software as a service when you're looking to grow. And the other half is starter, where you are just starting out, you have some ideas, you're trying to validate them and get to the point to where you can build your own software as a service or company. So I'm specifically at the starter edition and the reason I like the starter edition uh, is there's a lot of people who are in the same vertical as I am and you know, I already freelance. I freelance, I do web design and different things like that. I expanded that and got into teaching where I am teaching on my podcast, writing books and different things like that. But I do have a couple of ideas for specific products that I wanna build and rather than just learn through trial and error, which is what I've done in the past, I have an opportunity to hear from people who have already been there, already been through it, and really just learn from them and take away their successes and their failures and just learn. So I'm here at Microcoff, I'm excited, I'm going to learn as much as I can, take notes, uh, try to give summaries to tell you what is happening to keep you all up to date on what you might have missed but also, it's an excuse to come to Las Vegas. Why not? So the week for me is starting out with this networking event tonight, and then it's gonna lead into all of the sessions that will last pretty much all day for the next couple of days. So let's go and head out to the networking event and just see how things go. So originally my plan was to give a play-by-play -play on what happened at MicroConf. I was gonna go to the conference, come back to the room and summarize, but I really didn't get a chance to do that. So um, I was so busy with all that was going on and it was so quick, uh, it just flew by, so I didn't get a chance. But I wanted to summarize what I learned and maybe you can take away some things from that as I wait here at the airport uh, in Las Vegas. So I'm still here in Las Vegas. And um, yeah, let me give a quick summary on what happened. So the first day I arrived and it was an evening reception. And at this reception, you had people from the growth side of the conference and the starter side of the conference. MicroConf is separated into two parts. Uh, the first part is growth. You already built a software as a service, a product, and you're looking to grow. You're looking for growth strategies and how you can take it to the next level or expand your business. And it has the starter track, which is a track that I went to, which is uh, you're just starting out, you're looking to grow your audience. Uh, maybe you already built a product, maybe you already built a service and uh, you're in the early stages or you just have an idea. You have an idea and you're just looking to start and you get to hear from people who have been there uh, before you who have grown products and they're telling you um, how you can grow it and the best course of action to take. So things kicked off with an evening reception as I mentioned and it was a good time to talk to people and just introduce yourself and find out what other people are doing. The great thing about this reception was it was both sides of the conference so uh, we all were there and it's a good opportunity just to say this is who I am this is what I do what do you think about it and in my case it was a good way to find out is what you're saying makes sense is how you describe your product valuable and do people lean in when they hear your idea or do they sit there like oh that's nice so it was just good to be there amongst uh, both men and women and see what other creators are doing not only that, but also it was a great opportunity for someone to listen to your idea and maybe give you some quick advice on maybe you, something you want to try different or they reference some type of software or they even reference maybe a website you can go to to find a resource that was helpful. So um, that was a great thing. Another great thing for me was the fact that I got to meet many people who um, I know online. Maybe I know them through Twitter or Instagram or some type of other social media but I bought their product, their product helped me. Or not only that, but I got to meet many people in which I listen to their podcast. So I listen to their podcast on a daily, if not weekly basis. 
and I got to meet them in person. So that was an awesome thing as well to meet the people that, you know, speak truth and speak to me and it helped me in my business, even though they don't know it. Right. So that was a great thing at the reception. So after that, we got into uh, the first day of microconf, which was um, Justin Jackson and Justin Jackson talked about what it takes to validate a product idea. And Justin has launched many different products. Uh, he's at megamaker.co. He launched many different things. Um, I've even interviewed him for my podcast. So it was good to actually finally meet him in person, but also listen to his talk. And he walked through certain things you need to think about when you're validating a product. I believe the main takeaway that stuck with me as Justin taught was when you are validating a product idea, you need to definitely do customer research, but that is not always glamorous. Sometimes that is finding what people are saying on Twitter. Sometimes that is diving into a form around a specific topic your audience cares about. So Justin mentioned many techniques and things you can do to validate your product, but I paid attention to what he didn't say, which was he didn't mention how many times he went to a forum he went on you know, Facebook, he went on Twitter and did not find anything. So I do believe when we're making new things, we try very quickly to move forward to the building phase when really the bulk of our time needs to be spent in customer research and finding out what are people saying and what do they need. So yeah, going on from there, um, you know, Adam taught about uh, nailing your first product launch and he walked through the process of how he had an idea for a product it was an online course with a lot of screencasts in which he was talking about coding. And he walked through the process of how he had the idea, how he worked on it, he brought it to market. And really, he, he built the product in public. So anytime he had an update, anytime he had something new, he would either put it on Twitter or send it to his mailing list. So he gave away probably 60% of his product in the marketing phase while trying to build it up. And it was very successful for him. And that product led to, I believe, 60,000 in sales for him. So it was an info product. And that was highly relevant to me because I have a couple of info products I'm working on, at least three specifically, and then I have something big coming behind that. So um, that was highly relevant to me. Um, and the biggest takeaway I have from him is literally listen to your audience and iterate in public. In his case, the fact that he built it in public helped build up his audience. And his audience wasn't huge. We're not talking about 20,000 people on an email list or anything like that. It literally was um, about almost 2,000 on his email list and whatever he had on Twitter, that was it. So you don't need a huge you know, audience to market an info product, but because so many people are making products nowadays, you do have to spend time understanding, is this going to be valuable to the people that I'm serving? So Adam gave many different examples. He talked about pricing. He talked about, you know, the logic. He talked about his launch sequence and how he sent out certain emails. So that was big for me and I learned a lot with that. So next up was Ali Bloom. And she talked about uh, onboarding. She's an onboarding specialist. Onboarding is the process in which you are um, bringing someone in to a new software or a new service. Um, how is that process? How do you go about it? The biggest takeaway I'd say from that, and because I do a lot of onboarding, and um, I love onboarding actually, I like the whole process. The biggest thing I would take, take away from her talk is literally you have to set up a cycle of what's important to your customer, meaning this. As soon as they get on, ask them, you know, what made them purchase or what is the biggest struggle that they have or you know, what is going on in their life and what they're really hoping your product will do for them. After you get that, tailor your onboarding process to cater to that. A lot of times when you sign up for a new software, new service, people say things like, um, thank you for signing up, you know, here's your login link, and then they put a whole bunch of information that's not important. And people drown in support documents, people drown in um, a whole bunch of text that's in the first email. People drown in um, whatever extra things that are given in the onboarding process when really people want to know, I just signed up, how does your product help me get to my end goal? But if you don't know what the number one main goal of why someone is using your product and how it makes their life better, then you're gonna throw a whole bunch of things at them they don't want to see. 
It needs to be very simple. Uh, an example she gave is uh, the Harvest app. Harvest is an app that allows you to time track your product on a team or as, as an individual, you can track your time and do many other things through Harvest as well. So when people sign up through Harvest, the first email they get says, create a project. That's the main call to action. Sure, there's support and other documents that are important, maybe even tutorials, but the first thing needs to be, I just signed up, help me um, use your product right now. As you notice, the scenery just changed in this video. I had to jump on a flight to, back to Houston, so now I'm in Houston finishing the video. The next main stage talk was from Mike Tabor. Uh, Mike is the host of Startups for the Rest of Us, a very good podcast. For anybody who's thinking about starting a business or building a startup for the ground up, tons of information on that podcast. But he had a talk and it was about following up without being annoying. Uh, Mike created a new service called Blue Tick. And it's pretty amazing, but what this service does is when you have a cold lead or someone who might not be familiar with you, and you have something that you would like to pitch to them or a service you feel would be valuable to them, you know, manually you would email them a certain number of times until you get a response or you would set up a um, automation sequence where you try to email them multiple times automatically and then finally when they reply, you know, you pitch your product. Mike invented a whole new software as a service that takes care of this for you. In other words, uh, blue tick, you state, um, you know, you connect your email account, you state, you know, which email you like to send to, they go through a certain sequence. And as soon as they reply, that reply ends up in your inbox and you're ready to talk to them or move forward in the process. So you don't see any of the email automation and it's not like seven emails. In other words, it's like you said it, do some other work. And if they reply, it gets right back to you. Uh, if they don't reply, then it's somewhat removes them from the list and moves on to another contact. So that service is amazing, but he just walked through the mentality of that service and how we can practically reach out to people who might not be familiar with our business and our service and help turn them into a warm lead and someone who does want to work with us. Next session after that was the man, the myth, the legend, uh, Patrick McKenzie. Uh, at the moment, Patrick McKenzie is working for Stripe Atlas and is really moving forward towards getting startups uh, connected and building up different businesses through that avenue. And it was just amazing to hear him. I've heard him on many podcasts and different things of that nature. Uh, one of the main takeaways I have from him and just everything I learned from him is learning what your value is as a creative. Uh, oftentimes it's easy to get imposter syndrome. It's easy to feel like what you do, um, you should not be paid that much for, especially if you're enjoying it. So you just have to fight against the myth, the myth that says you can work and do work that is enjoyable and get paid a lot for it because the work is valuable. So that's been his stance, but his talk specifically was um, your startup in the first 60 days. And he just walked through in the first couple of months of your startup, there's some essentials that you need to have. For example, some highlights that he had are right here. He talks about if you're gonna move forward with a software as a service or a certain course idea or a different business idea, you have to validate it. So you need to have at least 10 conversations that are of great value, um, 500 email signups of people waiting and 10 people who are committed to purchase, whether it be through pre-sale or committed to purchase, you know, your specific um, product. Um, so again, uh, things like that, uh, he just talked about, you know, if you're going to build a startup in the first 60 days of certain things you need to do. He also commented on things like, you know, after the first 60 days, you know, you really need to think in a mentality of one day this company will be bigger than just you. One day the company will grow. Therefore, you need to make sure to put yourself in a position to where you're acting like it. So after that 60 days, are you positioning yourself for the company to grow? In the next session, we got into a little bit more about Facebook ads, and this is with uh, Moishka Mars, uh, but I believe she had a name change, so it's uh, Moishka Zove. I don't know if I mispronounced that. If I did, my bad. In her session, we dove into Facebook ads, and the main takeaway I got from that was pretty much based upon where people are at in the funnel, you need to show them a different ad. So 
there is a cold lead, someone who's not familiar with your product or who you are possibly. Uh, there is a warm lead and then there is a hot lead or a lead which you should retarget because they're already familiar with your product. So for those cold leads, create some type of awesome content, whether it is a download, a checklist, or just an awesome blog article and, you know, pick some targeting. So if you're a web designer, you know, you may, and you're trying to educate other creatives, maybe you need to find people on Facebook who are interested in web design or like web design based pages and, you know, target your art article to them. After they visited your website, uh, you should have installed the Facebook pixel on your website so that you could retarget them later. So after they come to your website, now, you know, they're in a sense in your retargeting pool. So the next time you can show them a different ad and on Facebook, you would do something to the effect of only show this ad to people who have visited your website in the last 30, 60 days, whatever, and show them something that is a little more of the next step of the funnel. So they're already familiar with you. Maybe you do show them something that is of value related to what they read or related to uh, something that's of a good value after they take into that, then you can target them with something or maybe even make the sale or get them on your email list. So it just talked about using Facebook to your advantage, but being wise about it. Treat Facebook like a conversation. Don't just say, hi, how you doing? Buy my product. You want to introduce yourself. Uh, you want to show them you have value and then later on remind them you have value and then maybe make a sale. It was good seeing her again at this conference because I also saw her at the Sean West conference that I went to and it was good just to see her and she's still talking about Facebook and her method still works. Even though Facebook has gone through a lot of changes uh, since the last time I heard her speak, it's good to see that these tactics still work. Going from there, this is probably the most emotional, um, gripping, entertaining talk at MicroConf and that was uh, Garrett DeMond talking about it won't be a straight line. Pretty much what he talked about was he built a software as a service uh, he was working that software as a service, things were going well. Uh, then he started having health issues with his leg. And they tried many different things, but because he did work remotely and all he needed was the internet, he was still able to work while he was going through his health issues. But things weren't really getting better and he was missing out on time with his family, amongst other things. So it finally came to the point to where he realized he should probably sell um, his business and it was rough for him to sell because he worked so hard to build it up but um, his family life outweighs his business life and he talks through that and tells that story very well and I'll try to link to anything like that um, so you can really see what he's talking about but you know just a lot of wisdom from what he learned in building the software as a service and he just shared that with the audience but he helped really bring it back home a lot of people were at this conference and yes, we want success. Yes, we have ideas. We would love for ideas to take off, blow up and make us a millionaire. We would love that. However, his talk really just brought it back to say, what is really important to you? Though you have an idea, um, though you already may have a business and you're just working on growing it, what is really important? Why are you doing this business? Because Garrett was faced with that decision in real life and he had to make a choice, and he, which led to even amputating his leg, but that made his family life better, and even what he was doing with his business better, even though it didn't seem like it. So what is more important than your business? Why do you do your business? That's a question that came out of his talk, and something that we all have to think with. We all want success, but what purpose does that success serve? Not only that, but what is truly success? It's not always a large business with a lot of money. The next talk was about building a sustainable software as a service, and it was about um, how this relates to permaculture. So this was also cool because I had a chance to talk to Marie, Marie Paulun. I think I'm saying that right. I don't know. But I had the opportunity to speak with her before her talk, and she just talked about how she purchased you know, a new home that came with a lot of land, and she had learned about permaculture and sustainability, and you know how to observe the land that you have and best take care of it. And this rolled over to some lessons that she could apply to her software as a service business. That you don't always need to jump in there and just start creating and just start building. A lot of times it just takes you a long time to observe the landscape, take notes, see what happens, have conversations, 
look at the normal flow of things. And I can definitely say for me personally, in my business, I'm tempted to do that. I'm tempted to have an idea and move on it quickly before somebody else has the idea or somebody else rolls out with it. You know, playing the race game and trying to race to the beginning and see if I can hurry up and get it out. But honestly, taking the time to ask the right questions, talk to the right people, see what my customers need, that really goes into building a better product. So customer research should outweigh building a lot. Customer research should be anywhere north of 60% of all the effort you put towards building something. Customer research over um, you talking about features and things that are maybe good to you and maybe good in your mindset, but you've never tested it. So do the work up front and things will be easier. Another takeaway from her talk was, you know, she had a business that was successful, but she wanted to build a software as a service business. And certain things didn't specifically relate. A lot of coaching that she did was hands-on. So uh, it's hard to scale things that are hands-on because it's based on time. You only have so much time in a given day and a given week. Um, so that was successful, but I believe she really wanted the software as a service revenue to be somewhat passive, right? You work very hard, you build up a software as a service. You know, you still work hard, but the money comes in and it's about recurring revenue. She came to the revelation that it's not all about recurring revenue and she did have a successful business. She didn't have to translate all of her money into recurring revenue. Maybe coaching was a good thing. So even in that realization, it was humbling to me because we all are somewhat chasing after that recurring revenue. Uh, different companies like Amazon or Apple or Google, you know, they built something and they're improving it, but the revenue is just going up as time goes by and as more people use their platform. It's tempting to chase that, but really there's a lot of value in um, services and there's nothing wrong with that. This brought us to the last talk, which was from Cortland Allen. Cortland Allen is the founder of Indie Hackers, an online community where you can go and learn about startups and learn about independent founders and ask questions and get answers. And uh, I believe Indie Hackers was purchased by Stripe. So now Cortland works with Stripe. So it was just awesome to finally meet him in person. I heard him on different podcasts heard of his background. So it was good just to meet him in person and learn from him. His session was specifically about navigating the startup landscape. And he gave this analogy that many times a startup is like uh, an airplane trying to take off on a runway. And the runway is the amount of cash you have. So you try to find an investor, you know, you try to find an angel investor or something of that nature, a venture capitalist to give you money. Then once you get the money, you start working your butt off as much as you can and try to get something up and running before you run out of runway, which is money. And the problem with that is you're either going to crash or if you take off, you might uh, not get far or what happens when you run out of runway. And he just shared a story about how he was given funds and that's exactly what happened to him, that uh, he spent a lot of time fumbling around, wrestling with the idea, customer research, wrestling with the idea and by the time he really started putting things in motion, uh, he was out of money, right? And it left him in a dilemma. Cortland has had hundreds, if not thousands of conversations with different startup founders. And he said, really navigating, you know, the startup land is more like a helicopter if you want to do it the right way, where, you know, there's a launch pad and, you know, you can do the right things, you can calculate and you just go up. So in other words, the runway is not so dependent on your ability for you to take off cash cash is not so dependent on your ability to take off you're here on the launch pad you put in the same work effort um, customer research and you fly up and sometimes that launch pad might be your full-time job there's a temptation to leave your job and just dive into the world of entrepreneurship but maybe staying where you are is a good thing because your job is serving as capital and recurring capital that's coming in to build your business. Sure, you won't have as much time, but it's a lot safer and you can still take off. And that's a reality that many creatives have. Even if you are working for yourself full-time independent, but you're thinking about building a product, client services is that launch pad. So if you need any type of funds, uh, client services is where it's at. You may have to get a couple of clients. There's nothing wrong with that. And that's actually 
why I still work with clients today. I feel like over time when you're a creator and you don't work with clients for a long time, you somewhat forget how it really feels to be in the trenches. And there's a certain nuance and there's a certain understanding when you continually work with clients because you're continually learning from them and seeing what clients want. So don't shy away from working with clients. That seems like a goal from everybody to move from freelancing to products, but products should just supplement your freelancing and some type of client work should still be in there somewhere. Overall, for my first time at MicroConf, I had a great time. I was able to meet some great people, form some relationships, listen to some people, and talk to people who I heard their podcast for months, if not years, and meet them in person. So it was good putting a face with a name, with a voice. And I also had some fun, you know, run around the city a little bit, uh, had an awesome time at this place called The Lost Room with some people, uh, it was a funny time. It was a great time. It's somewhat like a, a mystery puzzle game, or I would say Resident Evil, the game in real life without the zombies. But I had fun even with that. And a lot of the time that I had was spent talking to people in conversation, whether we're having breakfast together in between sessions. Um, there was a lot of value in the conversations in those people. So I look forward to reaching out to those people following up, but I also look forward to seeing what they do because there was tons of ideas there and I would love to see everybody move on those ideas. Again, MicroConf was a great time. Um, it is a valuable, highly valuable conference. And if you have a product or are thinking about building a product, I definitely recommend you go. Um, everything I said was a quick summary and just some of my thoughts of what MicroConf brought to the table, but I would recommend you check out microconfrecap.com and I'll put a link, but uh, microconfrecap.com because uh, they were live blogging the conference, writing everything down from the growth in the starter track, all the highlights and some of the slides as well. So a lot of things that I learned, yes, it won't be in person, but you could literally read and get some of the same value that I got when I was at microconf at Las Vegas. So it was a great time. Thank you for checking out this video and I will catch you in the next episode.